Navalny said, just before he went to Russia, he said, I was number one on Putin's skill list, you're number one now. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Bali. My name is Jure Albert. I'm the director of the Bali. So um, tonight we're very, very happy to uh, have the, to welcome the courageous journalist Christoph Grosev. I don't think I really need to introduce you very long, but um, um, you are uh, formerly you formerly were the lead investigator at Bellingcat, um, uh, and now you have been direct uh, you have been appointed as the director of Bellingcat um, not too long ago. And just for full disclosure. Um, I'm a member of the supervisory board of Bellingcat, so I suppose um, you could see this evening as a performance review. So, how are you, Christo? <laughs> it's very unusual, yeah. How are you? I uh, feel great, and um, I hope you ask tough questions. I will try and do my best, yeah. I think one of the first moments when Bellingcat came sort of in the eye of the world was the MH17 um, investigation. Uh, you were also involved in, but another one, another one which really caught the eye of the world was the um, Navalny poisoning and the way Navalny was treated by the Russians and the discovery that um, he was actually poisoned by um, uh, the Russian FSB. Do you think it was done on purpose to take out the opposition by the Russian and then the war actually came, or is that too simple? There was definitely a uh, plan to curtail free media in the uh, anticipation of the war. That was a plan that started uh, at around the time that Navalny came back, 2021, the beginning. I don't think um, that Putin expected him to come back, so he had kind of gotten rid of him, he thought, mm -hmm. and then he started the program of curtailing the free media, and the initial plans to arrest journalists, which materialized later in the year started. We got a lot of tips from people in law enforcement and uh, even uh, even disgruntled FSB officer who said, tell, well, uh, emails, um, anonymous emails to our accounts, tell your Russian journalist friend, friends to flee. So it was kind of pre-announced. But to answer your question, whether Navalny was part of the uh, plan to clean up, it could be, but you know, there's the opposite theory as well. Uh, our good friend Roman Dobrohotov uh, from the Insider Russia. Mm -hmm. He has the theory that the exact opposite took place. Uh, Putin had prepared for war in 2021 because there was open source evidence already in December and January 2021 that there was a surge of troops towards the border for another exercise. For that war to start, you need a mobilization of all the available resources, including the police, the Rosgvardia, the internal troops and stuff like that. And then suddenly Navalny, against all odds, comes back in yeah, January. Which is sort of a crazy thing to do, actually. It's a wild card, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And then people go to the streets, hundreds of thousands of people throughout the country, uh, if you count them together, and then all of the Rosgard, all the police, they have to deal with that. So there's this hypothesis that actually Navalny's crazy return delayed the war by one year. Mm -hmm. How credible do you think that is? At least 50%, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Because there is not an endless amount of troops. Putin, you would think that the Russian army would be so vast that they don't care, but now we know. You know. No, he would have known that at least, right? Uh, he would have known that he doesn't plan to do mobilization. Uh, he would have known that he needs definitely the... I mean, consider that from his point of view, obviously he didn't know anything, as it turns out, right? Because he expected this war to be over in seven days. Putin thought that it would be over in no time, there would be a real blitzkrieg, and it's plausible. Um, so was he lied to by his whole organization, or, is, or did something else happen? Or is I, I think so. Um, we investigated a lot of Russian military operations since 2014. One of them really enlightened us, enlightened us about how the Russian army lies to the top. Mm -hmm. That was when we investigated a very uh, serious war crime, which was shelling of a residential area by Russian military troops in January 2015 in Mariupol. That's before people knew where Mariupol was, now everybody yeah. knows, but then uh, a Russian army artillery unit had crossed the border in the middle of the night to go and shell Mariupol. It was essentially terrorism. And then they went back um, 
And we investigated this case. That investigation resulted in us listening to about 5,000 phone calls that were intercepted and were part of the criminal case file, and they were shared with us. And you could hear the Russian soldiers at every level of the hierarchy lying to their superiors. Uh -huh. They were embellishing the story. In one particular case, uh, an <laughs> artillery unit had, <laughs> had used uh, one of these uh, grenade launchers, and somebody put two grenades on top of one another. So obviously this exploded. Uh, People got killed. Uh, about eight of them had been killed. And the troop commander, or the, the commander of this uh, unit was talking to his boss and saying, what do I report? What do I put in there? And then his boss from Rostov thinks and says, put in there a very precise strike from Ukrainian artillery. So, and imagine what gets to the top to put in. So of course, with that attitude, he was getting a rosy picture. People that I know in Russia, former military uh, intelligence officers who are now living in the West, they, they kept telling me, how can Putin believe that the army is at the top shape when the rest of the economy is clearly terrible? Yeah? So why would somebody assume that the army is different than the rest of the economy? But clearly he did. And the last part of the answer to your question is that um, they, Putin really was fed false information that there was a fifth column in Ukraine ready to hand over the country. Yeah, people would be actually waving yes. roses when he... And this is an interesting phenomenon because what happened was the FSB was actually charged with this to try to recruit hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of agents that would hand over. This would include people at the lo local government, this would include people in the intelligence services, the security service, police, in the army. And yes, the FSB had a group of 160 people whose only job, each of them, was to liaise, recruit, take these people to the Maldives for a trip, and then they would plot with them. And they would pay for their vacation. They would give them cash. So imagine 160 to the people, you know, as an example, but yes, Seychelles, Maldives, we've tracked them to Cyprus, everywhere. Because that's the easiest way for them to meet with their assets. They can't go to Ukraine, because, yeah. Yeah. and these guys can't go and to it's Russia. Also a nice place to go. So they go to a nice place, yeah. Mm. So. Imagine 160 people. Sounds a bit like James Bond, doesn't it? Yeah. Each of them was running about 20 assets. At the Seychelles. Go At on. the Seychelles. So imagine the number of trips. Imagine yeah. the number of, of, of dollars that were paid to these yeah. people. So you can track that, of course. Because, yeah. yeah. And then these people promised, yeah, 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 give me more money. And the war, the war starts, I come to you, yeah. And then nobody, nobody. They just took the money. They took the money. And the Seychelles. And, and yeah. the Seychelles yeah. trips. Yeah. Yeah. And delivered nothing. Beautiful. It's like scamming the scammer. Yeah, yeah. So he's in real panic now. Well, I think he's been in panic since the start of the war. Um, the way people who know him describe his behavior now is he lives every week, almost as if it's the last week of his life. Yeah? So he doesn't feel the manipulator. He feels manipulated. He feels that the war is imposed on him. It's not something he planned for. So the strategy is written on a week-by-week -week basis. That sounds really Dangerous. Well, it's important to know that because we can kind of plan for that. It's also dangerous because somebody like that can press a nuclear button just like that. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you're asking me, will he? I really hope that the current trend of the war, which shows infallibility or fallibility of the Russian army, clearly to everybody, I'm sure we'll talk about that, makes it unlikely that people around him or below him will follow his orders to press the nuclear button because uh, even that will not be a certain win and nobody wants to actually be indicted at the Nuremberg 2.0. So holding them accountable and pointing out that you will be, uh, that, there will, that actually the deeds and the misdeeds which have been perpetrated are um, a scene and... Um, Written down archived, and, and yeah. archived. Yeah, yeah, archived. You're making a good point that I didn't even think about, that uh, this war is different than previous wars because there's a proven record of investigative journalists making uh, a real-time, validatable um, archive of the war crimes. This has never happened before. Before it was all based on hearsay, based on claims of one army. History was written by the victors. Also. Different now, different. Yeah, yeah. It's transparent, and after, and, it's open and source. And years after the fact, normally. 
Yeah, yeah and, and that, that should make people, especially in commanding positions, think twice before, before taking orders. You've seen the Navalny film, right? There are these guys. There was a secret, the secretest of secret poisoners. They had personal promises that their names will never be known, right? Made to them, yeah. Made by, to them, by the exactly, yeah. Yep, yeah. Now their names are known, their faces are known, and then their relatives disowned them and, and divorced them and stuff like that. So this would lead to a different attitude by the next recruitees for poisoners. They will not believe anymore the promise. So I think we're doing a good deal because we are reducing the trust in the system of intransparency, of, of secrecy. And in the war, it should be the same as well. Open source journalism, journalism in general, and investigative journalism might be one of the few guarantees we have that war will not got, not got, got out of hand. In a, in a competent war, yes. But this also seems to be an incompetent war. It seems to be a war sure. where there's no control sure. over how yeah. the people on the ground act. Yeah. 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 But um, yeah. Yeah. somebody advised Putin to do one thing smart. He moved the war, the cost of the war in Russia, outside of the capital. So the cost of war is paid by the poorest of the yeah. regions. By the regions on the other side of Ural. Exactly, yeah, right. So if you go there, you will feel the anti-war sentiment because the mothers know, because the, the, the body bags are there. Yeah. If you go to Moscow, um, it's life as normal. And this is a smart strategy, right? And it leads also to an interesting phenomenon, which is the soldiers and the mercenaries are now complaining that they're fighting against people who are supported by all of society. So Ukraine is mobilized, supporting all of it. And they, the Russian, are forgotten by their society because the news in the evening tells the people in Russia, everything is okay, we're winning. And nobody pays attention to the war anymore. So these people are there and they're dying. The Ukrainians are kicking their ass the last week. But in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, they think everything is fine. So nobody even bothers to check on their, or help them, or, or, or sign up for a volunteer. So it's funny, but Putin did get some advice to do some things right. But it's like a butterfly effect. You move one thing and then you create another problem at the same time. How on earth did you learn to do that? Because you, came, you became quite good at it. You became sort of even the, the rock star of, 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 of investigative journalism. Where, where, where did you came across this? Mm. Well, in Bellingcat, each of our investigation actually leads to another investigation. Mm -hmm. And it's cumulative knowledge that you build. So one of the things we, we figured out in this Kripal investigation case was that Russian spies use the sequential passport numbers for their fake identities, right? But that means we can go and in leaked databases, we can find consecutive other passports And then we have a new name that we didn't know before. Mm -hmm. And then we look at where did this person fly to? Oh, wh wait a second, he was in uh, the Czech Republic when there was an explosion in the Czech Republic. So we discover a new crime that was a cold case before, just based on such residual data from previous investigations. How do we learn to follow um, tra uh, well, the travel? I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious. Actually, when we were investigating even MH17, we we used leaked travel databases to find out who had flown to Rostov near the border with Ukraine just before the downing of MH17, and who had flown back after that, just after. And we were able to find senior members from the FSB who were in charge of um, providing authorization for the transport of uh, heavy weapons across the border. Clearly, these people become prime suspects in an investigation case. Uh, so yeah, having a database of travel especially in a corrupt country like Russia where everybody sells everything, because that's the recipe for survival of Putin. He has to allow corruption at every level, yeah. including at police. FSB. Including people who work for the telephone company. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, that is a boon for investigative journalism. We just need to think in terms of patterns. And you can buy all this sort of... A lot of these leaked databases are first sold to somebody, and then they become open source within a year because somebody gets tired of the, and says, dump some on torrent sites or on forums, and you can just download them for free. And then you sent Navalny a tweet? Yeah, a direct message. Yeah, a DM. Yeah. You didn't know him? No, no, no. I mean, uh, we, had, <laughs> we had actually argued on Twitter before. Ah. 
So, but of course he was curious what, what, what I had found. So he said, call me on Zoom, but make sure the camera is on because I need to be sure that it's you and not, not the FSB, right? Um, let's be very critical, like you asked. You're working with Navalny, which is a politician. I mean, isn't Bellingcat supposed to be independent journalist? Um, um, you know, how, how th th he's, a, he's the opposition leader. I ask myself one question. If this was not Navalny, but it was the most hateful, unpleasant Russian politician that I was investigating. Yeah, there's some, some very hateful types, yeah. I, I, I actually visualized somebody, right? Yeah. Uh, Zhirinovsky, I mean, yeah, he died yeah, in the yeah, meantime. Yeah. But <laughs> I visualized him, I said, huh. would I be doing still this? Mm -hmm. And the answer was yes. Yeah. Because this guy, a government tried to kill him. Mm -hmm. And this guy is not getting any chance of justice in his country or anywhere because nobody's going to investigate this crime because of the principle of legal sovereignty. That means only the country where it happened can investigate it. Will it? Will Russia? No. No. So his only chance, or her only chance of justice, is us giving him this moment of him confronting the, the would-be killers. That's mm -hmm. the only chance of justice that, that Alexei will have. So that means that you're amend amending a wrong into international justice system. Yeah, that's clearly where I see, and many of my colleagues see our niche, which is filling in this void in the international legal justice system. It has two voids for crimes that are perpetrated by a country in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. The Russians in Ukraine? The Russians, or, or the Russians in, in Syria. In Syria, or no. the Russians in uh, Germany when, yeah. when a Russian killer killed uh, an asylum seeker. The Americans there. in Afghanistan. The Americans in Afghanistan, Russia in, um, in, in, in Salisbury, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The current legal system requires, it has something called legal assistance. So. Let's take the example in Germany. The, uh, the guy was killed by a Russian guy carrying a fake identity passport. And Germany asked Russia, according to the international rules of legal exchange of information, please tell us who this person is. Does he really exist? If not, this face, this fingerprints, does it match somebody else? And Russia provided a bunch of bull, right? They said, yes, this is the real person. We've checked his fingerprints. So Russia lied. This is a big gap in the international, because if we hadn't jumped in mm -hmm. to provide the actual evidence of who this person is, whose fingerprints they are, who the tattoo belongs to, the German prosecution would have had to trust the Russian government. Had to? Why? Because there's no alternative, there's no mandate for Germany to go and investigate in Russia and find According anything to in international databases. Law. So According they, to international yeah. law, yeah. And the German prosecution turned to their intelligence service and the intelligence services said, we don't know. Yeah. And, and the second gap is what happened to Navalny or to Dmitry Bikov, the poet who was poisoned by the same uh, poisoners, to Vladimir Karamurza, who was poisoned twice by the same poisoners, to um, Nemtsov, who was killed with, with a gun in front of the Kremlin. No other country will investigate this. So no. it needs something like a forensic investigator that will do that. And Bellingcat and others are, doing, are filling that gap. Bellingcat is a very small organization. And uh, there's a lot of volunteers and st stuff like that. But, I mean, basically, it's, some of it is a lot of rag tech and becomes more and more professional, but still. How on earth are you able to do 90% of the work which the German Secret Service can only 10%? They have so much more resources. We have several advantages. We, we don't have to abide by this principle of uh, legal sovereignty. So we can go into Russia and we can buy this data, right? Mm, we can collaborate with other media that we trust, so it becomes almost a crowdsourced mm -hmm. um, process. So we leverage our methods, but they're done, done by more people, by the Insider, by the Spiegel, and it becomes a professional group of eight or ten investigators working on a particular case. Mm -hmm. And it becomes our real life 24-7 for three months or four months or whatever time it takes. We take it home. I don't think the prosecution or the intelligence services take these projects home. And, and, and the last thing that I would mention where we have an advantage over them is we see it on a transnational basis. So we see the crime group, which works on many countries, and we understand over time their methods in a way that local prosecutors and even local intelligence see it only from their point of view. You need to accumulate knowledge from many markets to know how the FSB work abroad. And I don't think local prosecutors have enough experience because they only see occasionally every 10 years one crime. And, and then it sounds very 
nice that you say, well, you know, this is a Russian citizen which has been killed by its own government. There's no redress. There's no possibility of... I understand that. And then you say, you know, I would have done the same with Yuranovsky and stuff like that. I tend to believe you, but can you remember a moment where you were investigating things or stuff where you thought, well, this, this is... Yeah. I mean, personally, where you thought, uh, this is very good news for somebody I really dislike. Well, when we investigated the Vladimir Karamurza poisoning mm -hmm. by the same FSB team, we did find that the American government had hidden evidence. Mm -hmm. That the FBI had actually destroyed evidence and that the CIA had hidden evidence. And it seemed to be based on some deal with, with, with Russia in that particular time. And we published that and we, we actually accused the American government. Mm. We investigated the, uh, uh, well, the war in Yemen uh, for a long time. For a long time, yeah. And we found that um, America sold weapons secretly, illegally, or at least undisclosed, to Saudi Arabia, and that those weapons ended up being used in the war. Yeah. And the American government didn't want that to be known. We, we investigated the bombing of, an, of a hospital in Afghanistan by NATO forces. We proved it was NATO forces. So yes, these are not pleasant findings, but we don't stop because they are not pleasant. Yeah. I mean, you can say that there's a bias of choosing what you investigate, but there, you can also say that most of the crime that is not admitted, because mind you, the Americans did admit that they bombed the hospital after. No, that's a big difference. Yeah. Sure. Even Iran admitted that they shot down the, the, the Boeing after we proved it to them. The only country that doesn't admit and continues doing it is, is Russia. It requires more attention because they, they lie more. They well, do, they lie yeah. more and they have the money to buy people to believe them. Yeah. It's proven that actually people who directly under Putin do poison Russian citizens, opposition leaders even, um, then it becomes very personal, of course. It's not very dangerous. Yeah. I mean, Navalny said after, just before he went to Russia, he said, I was number one on Putin's skill list, you're number one now. I mean, he knows more than we do, so I guess some of that is true. Maybe not number one, I mean, like number four or five. Yeah, that's a relief. Yeah. <laughs> Big relief. <laughs> uh, but what, do you stop? I mean, no. Actually, one one tool to protect yourself is to be always like in the middle of a new investigation so that they have at least a reputation cost to, to take you out. But of course we take precautions and uh, uh, I mean Desi Bellingcat's uh, chief operating officer is here. She knows the focus on security, on digital, but also hiding our office. You don't know where our office is. We're not going to tell you. No. I, I didn't know where our office is. I, I hardly found it today. So yeah, that's no. an example of... No, but it's true. I don't know. The, the riskiest times are at pre-announced events like this. Yeah. <laughs> That's just to reassure you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Isn't that dangerous? Because now you have an enemy who's one of the most no, I mean, I, I, powerful I, I, people in the world? Uh, that, that we don't think of that. I mean, Elliot recently said, yes, if you start thinking about it, it, it will depress you. But we don't think of that. I do think about other people that we've exposed to danger. I mean, whistleblowers who shared with us and... Uh, and that takes an emotional toll that, especially when you see them go after them and arrest them, and uh, uh, that, that, that more forces self-censorship of what you don't investigate because you don't want to expose people to risk. Um, so you put a higher threshold on what is worth investigating. Yeah, because you risk other people's lives. Yeah, so you need to be more sure or be exactly. more important. But yeah. then you take yourself out of the equation, which probably, yeah, which is what normal people would call courageous. I, I don't I'm know. Not saying I mean, some people normal, say crazy, but, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it also depends on what kind of family you have. Like Navalny was allowed, encouraged by his family to go back to Russia. We all think that's crazy. but He's, he's in a camp now and probably will die there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But... Many of us in Bellingham being allowed by our partners and or, or wives or husbands to do that is also part of the equation. Recently, you at least a few of the Bellingham's investi investigative journalists published tracking the faceless killers who mutilated and executed the Ukrainian POW. It's on the Bellingham website again, uh, proving sort of the same methods of inv investigation. Partly here as well, proving who actually did mutilate and kill a. Ukrainian prisoner of war. 
the basis of the investigation are three uh, rather cool reels or movies or how do you want to call them? Uh, clips, short videos. Yeah. Short videos of um, uh, people per doing uh, horrendous things. Uh, you don't actually link to those videos, so you don't put them on the Bellacat site or a link on it. The, this, this article has been probably the most controversial in terms of internal processes of what we should do with the findings and what we shouldn't do mm -hmm. than anything we've had before. And there was no consensus, I have to say. Um, but it's what the editors, it, there's a sovereignty of the editors in ours. Uh, the investigators, I was part of the team, um, Eric and Michael and, uh, and um, Carlos were all working on this for about six days nonstop, 24-7 almost. We, we found the person who did it. Yeah. We actually talked to him. Yeah. We spent hours watching through the most horrible, on repeat, most horrible thing yeah, anyone I, has seen. I was seen. going to ask you, but now, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We cried when we watched it, but we had to watch it because we needed to see a pattern of a hand and then compare it. And then, knowing who he is, agreeing that he is that, the editors told us, no, we're not going to publish his name, and we'll blur up the faces. Obviously, this led to different opinions, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, but some of the choices we made, I completely, completely agree with, and there's, there was no controversy between any of the members of the team. And these included not linking to, to this. Yeah. Anybody who needs to validate the video can find it easily. But we don't want to expose the regular audience to trauma. Yeah. This is trauma that we have to be trained how to survive. We actually have trauma classes, trauma, uh, uh, trauma processing. Trauma survival, yeah, survival classes, classes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, we also have trauma classes, but those are different. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, and, and the regular reader doesn't, so we can't do that. Yeah? And the second thing um, that we agree with is that we don't link to their social media profiles because that will expose their relatives also to doxing. So these are the two things that there's no controversy about. But um, blurring the face of somebody who, even in videos that he agreed, that he posted publicly, or Russian media posted publicly... And where he agrees that it's him. Huh? That it's him. Yeah. It's a bit of a very high standard, yeah? So my problem was not really the high standard we set for ourselves. That's okay. But if you know that other media will immediately unblur it and, and publish also the links to the uh, family members and stuff like that, um, it, it appears to be a bit, a bit hypo hypocritical. You're covering your own moral ass, but you're not really helping the cause or the, the people. So, but anyway, it's just a philosophical viewpoint. Mm -hmm. I'm proud that we took this high moral road despite the fact that many accused us of just being uh, crazy by blurring everybody's face. Difficult, very difficult. difficult. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Protecting a criminal. Well, <laughs> let's talk about the emotional toll of talking to a criminal for 45 minutes, which I did, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the guy that I had just watched on repeat, yeah. mutilating somebody and then shooting him in the head, and then me talking to him and listening to his lies. Yeah, a lot of it was lies, yeah. It, it's, it's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah. But we had to go through that. Why? We had to give him the right of reply, the right to comment. And believe it or not, some of them, like we saw with Kudravtsev, they tell you more than you knew. Yeah, also in this case, isn't this it? This guy also. Yeah. 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 He actually, in his lies, he said, oh, this was done by Ukrainians, this video of Ukrainians. And I, I asked, do you know where they did it? And he named the place where he was. So that's how we found it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you, so in order to get results, you might, you probably have to. Yeah. 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 Also, you have to because it's his right to respond. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, are you willing to actually traumatize you and your editors because of out of sheer journalistic ethics? Well, there was... I'm not criticizing you, I'm just there was wondering, strong wondering whether that's... You, yeah. know, you know, I mean, w the, the problem is there's journalism, there's journalism. Uh, there, this case had taken so much attention, public attention. Um, and there were people who were saying, this is not real, this video is fake. Mm -hmm. 
and then there were other people who said, oh, we found the killer, we found the, the, the guy, and they put a completely, well, maybe not innocent guy because he was also a Russian soldier, but not the guy who was in this video. And they put his name out, and these were like uh, volunteer researchers who did that, so they doxed the wrong guy. So we had the obligation, first of all, to say, was this a real video, authentic or not? Because if it's not authentic, it would be also a story that Ukraine would have created this fake video, which is horrendous. That's a very important point, of course. Because if you're wrong, actually it explodes in your face and actually does damage to other people in the conflict or other sides in the conflict or to the Ukrainian side. Or to yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're not very sure and if you have everything in place, it will uh, But if backfire. you're not very sure, you should not publish. Ah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so you have to go through all this pain an effort to yeah. to do it. Thank you very much for your openness. Thank you, Thank you for coming here. <laughs>